Good morning. Inspired by the commitment of today's landscape design and architecture speakers and their pursuit for impactful practices, Rand, Water, Rand Water's WaterWise campaign has joined SCAPE to support increasing awareness of the need to value our country's water and use it wisely. On a collective journey across South Africa's terrain, three local industry experts, Mareka Wernig, Tamsin Farragher, and Amy Thompson, aim to unearth what it would take to make the future of our landscapes more resilient and more sustainable. From climate change to our relationships with nature and each other, we can't ignore that the connection between the landscape and the built environment needs reprioritizing. So when a call to action is no longer enough to save our, to save our future selves, how does the industry activate change that starts today? So our very first speaker here this morning is Tamsin Farragher. Very lovely to be on stage with you, Tamsin. Tamsin is an ally of our city's landscape, dedicating her work and wisdom to the issue of water sensitivity within the local environment. As an integral player of the city of Cape Town's resilience planning team, Tamsin recognizes that resilience in the landscape relies on a harmony between ethos and action. But do those designing our cities plant the potential for resilience from the very beginning? Thank you, Tamsin. Great, this is exactly what I was trying to avoid. Bear with me. <laughs> I have to log in again. This is what resilience looks like to everybody. It's standing on a podium, unable to get to your presentation, and still being able to kind of keep going. All right. Right, so big thank you to the SCAPE team for this opportunity to share a little bit of my work in the city of Cape Town's risk and resilience team. We're now risk as well as resilience as about, I think, six weeks ago. Uh, as introduced by Ruben, my name is Tamsin Farragher. Uh, and the presentation's title today is Resilience, Ubuntu and Cities, Using What We Know to Grow and Thrive. So what is resilience? What is Ubuntu? And I think the most important question is, why should we care? The generally accepted definition of resilience is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems in a city to survive, adapt, and thrive, no matter what kind of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. On the other hand, Ubuntu is an African philosophy that states that I am because you are. It is a belief in a universal bond of sharing that connects all humanity. In my mind, resilience is therefore referring to the shocks and the stresses, the drama, whereas Ubuntu is the way and our ability to respond, both of which are either strengthened or weakened by Ubuntu, the social infrastructure of our cities. Natural, urban, social, financial systems, they're all buckling under the strain of increasing shocks and stresses that are coming faster and harder. They're damaging the very fabric of our communities and our cities. We city makers make the looms and the shuttles that weave this fabric. So does our work build this resilience and do our, our, our um, designs connect humanity? How we think about and build our cities is therefore critical not only in building resilience to shocks and stresses, but also in building Ubuntu. Right, so what does resilience look like? We all want to do resilience, but how do we know that we're doing it? So the wheels on the right are not what resilience looks like, but it is a representation of 24 themes across 156 questions and indicators. I know this is not our thing as designers, um, but it's kind of what resilience looks like. 
The City of Cape Town worked with the 100 resilient cities um, in 2016 through to 2018 to develop our resilience strategy. It uses an online tool that was developed by Arab that is, in fact, it's just an online survey, really. But what it does that's very cool is it evaluates against international benchmarks. So the kind of data that gets collected is qualitative at the top and quantitative. Qualitative, that's perceptions, that's opinions of people like us, whereas the qualitative is the data. It's the stats SA type stuff. And what's interesting is that the two don't always match up because we think we know a lot more than we actually do. The tool is useful because it translates all of this data into the wheels, which then give us an indication of our resilience. And we didn't do too badly in 2018. As you can see, there are just three areas where there's a bit more work that we need to do. So <laughs> if that's not resilience, is this resilience? You know, what would it look like? What would we see? How would we know? One of the challenges of resilience work is its dynamism. Whether it's urban or natural or social systems, invariably shocks and stresses disrupt that system. The diagram on the right represents Cape Town's food system. So this is, I'm a landscape architect, but this is the kind of work that I do now. It's complex, it's complicated. It, this is a distillation of piles and piles of, of documents and research papers. Um, which I distilled into this diagram because as visual people, it helped me to figure out what this thing is. What does it actually look like? What, is, what do all of these words look like if we were to draw them? And from there, I was then able to start to unpick where the vulnerabilities and the risks were. So <laughs> no sooner did I think I had a handle, so this is pre-COVID, then COVID hit. And we discovered that actually the issue wasn't necessarily what we thought it was, which was hunger and nutrition only but it was also in how people accessed food, because suddenly people were reliant on food parcels and NGOs. And then, just when things were kind of like getting exciting and start, or rather getting less exciting and starting to slow down, the Ukraine-Russia crisis hit, and our imports were affected. And this is where we are now with load shedding. So is this what resilience is? No, but it is a representation of that dynamism and that deep system that sits underneath it that we need to understand in order to build resilience. Right, so, if the food systems diagram isn't what resilience looks like, is this what resilience looks like? There are three points that I'd like to make here. Number one, words matter. There's seven qualities, you guys can read through them in the blue rectangle, and each word connects to our work as built environment professionals. Number two, resilience is multifaceted. A project could be something that delivers resilience, but a project also needs to be resilience in itself. Number three, doing something new means changing the way that we do things. As built environment professionals, we, we like to do things in a particular way. We use the same people, the same tools, and unsurprisingly, we have the same outcome. So in order to build resilience, we're gonna to have to start to change the way that we, we work together. And that means that we have to start to learn to work together. So this is obviously from a government perspective, so it's talking about multiple departments and multifunctionality. But there's no reason why this wouldn't translate into the types of projects that we do. So, different perspectives. Are they a good thing? What if we welcome different perspectives? Maybe a different perspective is what we need to get those birds flying off the screen. And this is an example of what a different perspective could be. Is this a detention pond? Yep, it's a detention pond. It's an engineering drawing, Nohal. You can see green lines, that's a boom. The orange lines, those are the stormwater pipe inlets. This is what it actually looks like. I joined this project, which is a future water project up at GCT. Um, what they're trying to do is pilot the potential of detention ponds for groundwater uh, recharge. But when I looked at it, I was like, oh my God, this is a park. This isn't a, you know, <laughs> this isn't a detention pond. But if you look at the words, and this is why words matter, it's all about the boom. It's all about the, the swampy area, which is fine, which is fine. But it shows you the, the potency of words, because this is still a detention pond. 
But that's actually, that berm is actually a walkway. So what if we said it's a walkway? Let's make it wider and design it so that it's a walkway. That swampy area. Maybe it's a wetland doing really, really important fighter remediation work. Maybe it's also an outdoor classroom. So it's important to know that the words matter, but it's also important to be able to use a different perspective because that's also the value of resilience, is that multi-dimensional value that they bring. They call it the resilience dividend. Again, so, you know, this is why words matter, but if words matter, what about monitoring evaluation? Is this a road? <laughs> it looks like a playground to me. The way we build our transport, we build roads, and it's measured. We've built so many kilometers of road. We've spent our budget. It was all transparent. AG loves us. It's all great. But for many Cape Tonians, they can't afford to use the transport that we're building these roads for. So the question for me is, how do we start to think about this critical infrastructure, which is road, as a way of knitting communities, of, of building the community where it is, you know, what if we measured how many trees we're planting or how many rain gardens we're building? How many joggers are on the road? How many bicycles are on the road? The metrics that we use to measure the outputs of our projects needs to change. Putting more cars on the road, how is that building a climate adaptive, resilient city? It simply isn't. And rather than saying we're building so many roads, how are we mitigating the impact of that road should also be part of that measurement. Again, <laughs> is this a shopping mall? It look, I mean, it looks like a shopping mall. It actually looks like a restaurant to me, but it's in the road. So the other thing we should be measuring, how many economic opportunities are we creating? When we measure the, the road infrastructure plans, it's all about economic opportunities, integration, all of those good and important things. But what about the opportunities created within the local context, within that neighborhood? How is that road and that, inter that, that additional infrastructure that that road brings building urban health, livability, and livelihood potential for those living who are not actually going to be getting on buses or cars or whatever to get to those opportunities because actually they're going to spend that money rather on food or school fees? Oops. So... The previous examples are intended to provoke a different way of thinking about the projects that we design and build, and some of us might even manage them. But I'd talk, like to talk a little bit now about how we value resources. So this is Kate Rayworth's donut um, economics diagram, and I love it, um, because it really is about, it really illustrates the finiteness of our resources. It's one planet, this is what we've got. How we use these resources is going to be critical for how we live our lives in the next, well, for forever. Um, so the question is, are we going to eat our way through those resources? Or are we going to try to find ways of doing more with less? I think to have skipped a slide. <coughs> right. Um, so taking us back to how we value resources, uh, that previous presentation um, of the, the Rand Water was talking about how water is our most valuable commodity. But stormwater is a wastewater. When you go through all the water governance, the acts, the legislation, the regulations, it's, it's, it's actually seen as a common enemy. And this comes out of the Red Book, which I call the Roroi Gefaar. If anyone else here has dealt with the Red Book, I mean, it makes you want to just like your head pop open. How can we be dealing with something that is a critical resource as a waste? So this project starts to say, hey, how do we start to change that? How do we, how do we start to think about stormwater as a valuable resource? Um, during the drought, the Adley Street Fountain was switched off, understandably. Um, but now it is up and going, and you can imagine there was a potent moment in Cape Town when the you know, the fountain went back on, it's like we're out of the dark, things are going to be okay. But we're still putting potable water into that fountain. So, you know, is this really how we're representing this new relationship with water? Um, so in, this, in the city of Cape Town, we were approached by the facilities management um, guys, and they said, we want to reimagine the fountain. Uh, we've got it going, but we think it could be doing more. 
uh, how do we start to use more sustainable water in the fountain, sustainable i.e. alternative. And so we got together um, and we pulled in Tana and Delta Big engineers, Tana Klitsen, sorry, and they tested some of the ideas that we have, which we're looking at how do we use some of the alternative water that is actually flowing through the city. What we found was that the stormwater quality was actually of such a poor quality that we couldn't really put it into the fountain. We really wanted kids to be able to get in there and get stuck in and explore and experience water. Um, and the quantities weren't as significant as everyone had thought. I mean, during the drought, we were constantly talking about how there are these thousands of liters going through the city that could be saving us from the drought. That's actually not really the case, it turns out. Um, but we were undeterred. Um, and found that there was really good quality water and good quantities of water sitting in the civic building, in our own building. And so the plan was to take that water, as you can see in the top diagram, and take it through constructed wetlands, let the fire remediation do its thing, and to store it. But there's a bigger idea and dream for this project as well, of how do we start to use this kind of infrastructure to also supply water within the broader context for non, non potable not context, sorry, precinct uh, for non potable purposes. Flushing toilets. I mean, that's what, 70% of most households' water goes to flushing toilets. How do we start to think about those resources in a different way? And importantly, and you can see from the bottom, it's a public space. So a lot of the potential for these types of projects sit within the public realm. And so we have to start to think about our public realm in a very different way. So, the big question. Can Ubuntu build resilience? The more I work in the resilience space, the more I'm convinced that we as city makers are not paying enough attention to social infrastructure. This could be public transport, streets, libraries, community kitchens, community gardens, nature reserves, the whole bank sheet. It is also the fine-grained systems, the social relationships and networks within communities that provide the safety nets for survival, particularly in informal environments. It is Ubuntu that underpins this infrastructure, which gives priority to the well-being of the community as a whole and says community as one of the building blocks of society. We know this in Cape Town. That's how we got out of the drought. That's how we got through COVID. And I believe that it is common humanity that particularly connects through nature. Ubuntu is our thing. Could it be the heart of African cities, the threads that bind and hold us? There is so much talk about smart cities, healthy cities, sponge cities. The list is long. So what about Ubuntu cities? I think the bigger question, though, for us city makers is what do we do with this knowledge and how does it influence our work? What would an Ubuntu city look like? And how would we also measure it? A lot of people think, oh, we'll do it through the policy. We've got great policy. Most cities battle to implement it, whether it's through imagination or resources. There are a number of different reasons. But the policy is not the problem. I was at an IPCC um, workshop last year, and um, they presented the climate science, and it was terrifying, and yep, we toast. And then they presented all the things we should be doing. And I was like, hang on a minute, we've been talking about this stuff since I was at Varsity, and Johan, <laughs> you guys have been talking about it since you were at Varsity. We know what we need to do. So the question is, why are we not doing it? And that's not the question that's been asked. It's like, oh, we should put green roofs in. Yes, we know we should be putting grooves in, but, but why are we not doing that? So it was <laughs> deeply frustrating for me, but what is also exciting is that people are doing stuff in spite of you know, these big ideas, they're infrastructural, they cost money, but there are a lot of people doing their thing. There are a lot of water heroes out there, and we found them last year through the Green Blue City Awards. Um, and through a number of Amy's uh, team's projects. So my challenge to you guys is, I'm clicking the wrong thing here. You know, I've got my cape, where's yours? We all have an enormous amount of power within the work that we do, that we get paid to do, but we also have our own agency as human beings. 
and how do we use that and how are we using that to build our Ubuntu cities? Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamsin. Um, just so everyone's aware, we will have a Q&A session at the end, so please keep those questions on hand uh, for the very end of the session. Um, our second speaker this morning is Amy Thompson, uh, a good friend and colleague of mine. Amy is the co-founder and director of Yes and Studio. Amy is a bright, shining landscape designer whose career boasts both academic and professional accolades. With her insight in the development and improvement of urban contemporary environments, particularly considering factors like climate change, Amy broaches the question, how do we become better contributors to our public spaces? Thank you so much, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Amy. I'm a professional overthinker. <laughs> so I would like to say thank you to the SCAPE team for giving me some sleepless nights pondering this what-if prompt. So, properly sleepless <laughs> nights. These are some of the questions that I've come up with to structure this, this talk today. Um, and I think they're questions that we've all been grappling with in this room. Like, what if we could do more with less? What if our projects could work towards solving multiple problems through good design solutions? What if we were to introduce new methods of public space making that bring different user groups into the process? And what if all of this could assist us in creating more resilient, sustainable urban environments and cities? These are questions that I'm sure many of us in this room have been grappling with. And over the last few years, we've been thinking specifically at Yes And how we use these prompts to create better, more dignified public spaces. It's no small task. The cities and urban environments that we live in are more complex than they've ever been before. We have climate change pressures, resource constraints, and growing, growing urbanization that are creating a wicked storm of events. We, in landscape, we, as landscape architects and designers, can no longer afford to solve one problem well, but we need to become pluralists creating space that, sol that works to solve the most urgent of our problems whilst contributing to positive placemaking and ideally harnessing ecosystem services. Phew, it's a lot. Our responses put forward today are by no means a silver bu bullet response. They build on ideas of massive small, which Kelvin Campbell has been um, promoting. They look at small ways of incremental change that can hopefully be replicable across both our projects and across all of our practices. The first small idea, I think, links to a lot of what Tamsin was speaking about. And I will take prompts as to change the name of what we're calling this, because it's not really good at the moment. But it's, what if we could do more with less? What, what if we could build one for, or what if we could build two for the price of one and a little bit extra? We've used this approach to sneak positive space making as an add-on to, to the provision of infrastructure on a number of our recent projects. In Europe, an informal settlement located a kilometer away from the international airport, we were tasked with, quote unquote, solving the water problem. Europe's experience with water is immediate. Like many informal settlements, it experiences devastating winter flooding. There's no formal stormwater or sewer system on site, and runoff drains across makeshift walkways. Potable water points are available at a rate of one per every 40 people, and, house, and they're used for household consumption and laundry. These water points, like the one that you see on the screen, are scattered along pathways, which on one hand makes them very accessible, but on the other hand adds to the water runoff problem because they're prone to breaking and leaking. This drainage results in muddy pathways, which are sometimes contaminated with solid waste and pose a serious health and safety hazard. Europe also lacks what we call traditional public space. Life happens out on the street, which is in some ways a really positive thing, but in other ways it creates a difficult situation 
because children often cross busy Clipfontaine Road to play in the neighboring cemetery. Our project attempts to reframe infrastructure as a positive good. It reimagines the provision of services to contribute to the public spaces in the settlement. The intervention, which you can see up here, stretches from the primary pedestrian access route into the settlement to a key intersection. This intersection was identified by community members as an emerging commercial and civic node. At the top, it's got a big creche, it's got a pharmacy across the way, and is surrounded by spaza shops. The intervention capitalizes on the existing activity by inserting new public spaces associated with upgraded water points. The plaza spaces are paved and gently dished to catch the stormwater. The surrounding areas channel this water down a newly made grass block pathway out onto Clipfontaine Road. Sustainable urban drainage systems line this walkway to catch the additional stormwater. And a gray water diversion system ties um, below the pathway to catch some of the more polluted water. This approach is not revolutionary. In fact, we visited a number of these incredible upgrade projects as part of our design project, uh, as part of our design process, and we learned deeply from these projects. What sets our approach apart is that we've tried to redefine infrastructure as a public good. And I think that this is one of the key takeaways that can be applied not only to informal settlement upgrade, but also to a number of our other projects. Can we view infrastructure as public space? And I think this, is, again, is something that Tamsin was talking about. In Europe, the spaces are designed to be flexible and multifunctional. Yes, they are engineered to drain and deal with water, but they're also carefully designed as spaces for, for gathering, sports courts, dance stages, and roadways to make um, access for emergency vehicles easier. The water points that define the spaces are designed ergonomically to provide washing platforms, but also seating areas that are used for sports spectators, children while their mum wash, and also just for hanging out. These squares may not look like much, but they represent some of the most important safe spaces within the community. They're regularly used as meeting points, as soccer pitches, and as go-kart tracks. The plaza has also recently been the location of a netball competition, where hoops were bought in, markings were chalked out, um, and the spaces around with these low walls became spectator seating. A purely engineered response to the water runoff down the makeshift pathways might have just introduced a concrete channel rather than a full walkway upgrade. But hearing the stories about how a simple upgrade allows residents to arrive at work with the confidence of dry shoes makes it feel like this two for one and a bit process is worth it. Harnessing infrastructural upgrades also has the potential to catalyze projects that have been in the pipeline for a little bit. If you've spent more than five minutes with me, you will have heard me talk about the Hermanus High Street upgrade. It's not a project that we did at Yes Sound Studio, but it is one that I am incredibly, incredibly proud of. Um, it was done as part of the amazing team at GAP, at the time led by Barbara Southworth, and this project in particular um, spearheaded by Hedwig Krumen Lemmer. This project, I think, does a lot to work towards building resilience in coastal small towns. The concept for this project is a vibrant shared street. It has um, a single paved surface that connects from building edge to building edge and an improved public realm with new street lights, um, street trees, signage, seating, and again, a supplementary soft um, sud system that supports the stormwater infrastructure. The whole street has become a pedestrian domain with the area earmarked for vehicles as guests in the space, defined by a subtle change in paving material and also through these bollards that line the street. This creates a shared environment that allows for the self-regulation of traffic, where vehicles don't dominate and people and cyclists take preference. High Street saw the introduction of 32 new street trees which I know that Ruben will <laughs> attest. Any project where we can get any street trees feels like a bit of a win. 
Um, these street trees line the street and are placed within a SUD system or sustainable urban drainage system. This, this drainage system supports the other stormwater upgrades that took place in the street and works to absorb the first stormwater that hits the road. This simple addition to the broader stormwater system allows trees to be irrigated naturally, deepening their root system and lessening their reliance on irrigation. The street was once just a transition space, a place that you'd park before you went to the, water, to the waterfront edge to see the, to see the whales. It's now become a destination in of itself. It's lined with galleries, cafes, restaurants, the best place to get a croissant in Cape Town, and, and all of these generously spill out onto the sidewalk, taking advantage of the shade underneath the trees. This reimagined street creates a slowed down, chilled atmosphere that is really brought to life by the community who use it. And another side of resilient city building in the face of COVID, I think is in fact the economic sustainability. And we've seen fantastic growth along High Street. And um, there have been community-led initiatives to shut the street on weekends since we, we did the upgrade. Um, there have been um, art fairs, there's a first Thursday, and I think in this picture you can see a particularly lively Bastille Festival was held. With both High Street and Europe, um, and some of our other street upgrades, we try not to take the design of our spaces too seriously. Stuffy spaces aren't fun for play. But in all our case studies, it is the user community who brings the space to life. It is the lived experience and wealth of community knowledge that is so often neglected in the design process. This is what Massive Small calls collective wisdom. They say smart citizens make smart cities. That a bottom up rather than a top down process can empower new generations of civic leaders. For me, this is the radical question that we've been grappling with. What is our role as designers? Can we recast ourselves rather than the top-down expert, but rather as facilitators that empower this like, future generation of owners of interventions? In Europe, in particular, we've campaigned for a more si sensitive in-situ design process, one that allows for incremental intervention, acknowledges the voice of communities through the design process. This approach and design methodology shifts the resource, resource consumption onto the designer, who becomes a translator, understanding community issues and constraints, and more importantly, identifying opportunities. The design process in Europe was an altogether humbling and inspiring one. We've learned many hard lessons. We redesigned what a typical design approach might be, and we continue to do so in the next phases of the project. We work closely with community leadership to understand the issues around the site, workshopping interventions together. During this process, and I think particularly for me, I'm a textbook introvert, we became very aware that not all voices are heard in these workshops or public meetings. So we tested ideas of listening differently, by creating safe and organic conversation spaces, particularly for women during the implementation phases of the project. These spaces were designed to allow for sharing over productive tasks. So in the pilot project, we introduced a planting club that ran weekly for the implementation of the project. This club was run as a series of practical workshops that imparted critical garden knowledge whilst establishing an on-site nursery that grew all the planting material for the project. We also worked with emerging contractors who hired a work workforce from the community. We as a team learned new ways of adaptive guideline-based design to respond to the rapid changes of the informal settlement. They were things like curbs should be as straight as possible, um, levels and drainage are key, so we did lots of bucket tests and bucket tests to check if the main channels were working, bucket tests to make sure the side system was getting sufficient water. This way of working has challenged many of the assumptions that I've had about myself as a designer and about the future of the profession. But I firmly believe that if we want to create a sustainable and resilient city, it must have the 
ability to withstand and recover from difficult con conditions. And this way of working with and empowering is one of the potential solutions to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmy. Our final speaker this morning is Mareka Huenach. She is a botanist, landscape designer, and author. Mareka navigates the industry with a focus on indigenous landscapes and what resilience means in the local context. Her expertise offers a pathway to consider how our relationship with the land influences the future of the industry and what that means for professionals trying to realign the course of landscaping as a whole. Thank you so much, Marika. Thank you, Ruben. Um, and, very, and big thanks to the SCAPE team for having, um, choosing this exciting theme. I mean, what if? What a fantastic um, theme for a seminar. Um, but so today I want to share something that has inspired me and given me a new sense of agency and purpose. And it all started with, an, um, with this article, Rivers in the Sky, How Deforestation is Affecting Global Water Cycles. And I quote, it starts off by saying, every tree in the forest is a fountain, sucking water out of the ground through its roots and releasing water vapor into the atmosphere through its foliage. In their billions, the trees create rivers of water in the air, rivers that form clouds and can create rainfall hundreds or even thousands of miles away. It's such a fascinating idea that trees make rain, but I thought it only applied to tropical rainforests. Until a few years later, when I came across the Climate Water Project on Instagram, which has these really simple graphics explaining the mechanism of the slow water cycle. And it all made such sense, and it became obvious to me that the link between the feedback loop between soil and plants and climate applies to all vegetation. So the person behind um, these informative posts is a physicist called Alpha Lowe. And I subsequently have listened to his podcast where he interviews various people and read his articles on Substack, and they really are well worth a read. I can highly recommend it. They're in-depth, um, but also very informative and, and clearly put across. So what do we mean by the slow water cycle, or sorry, the small water cycle? It's also known as precipitation recycling or moisture recycling. And in essence, it says that a large proportion, um, that when, when water evaporates, a large proportion of it returns in the form of, ra uh, of rain or dew or mist or fog. And in this way, the moisture is recycled locally and sometimes multiple times. So for argument's sake, a water molecule that a plant trans evapor transpires could form clouds and then come back down again and cycle like that several times. Sometimes it's carried further inland by the wind and then it's called moisture hopping. So this map shows the amount of precipitation recycling globally. And if you look at Cape Town, for example, we know that Cape Town has mainly frontal rain from the ocean. So the precipitation recycling is only 10 to 20%. But as you move inwards towards the little Karoo, well, the Karoo and the interior, it, this increases to, to between 30 to 50%. So up to half of rain is actually created by the soil and the vegetation there. And when you go to Central and Western Africa, it's 60 to 70%. Kind of logical if you think of the rainforests that are there. But this is really significant. At present, the mainstream worldview is saying that rain comes mainly from the oceans and that global warming is all because of greenhouse emissions. And this has focused all the attention on fossil fuels and carbon, which conveniently has a simple chemistry, making it relatively easy to quantify and model. However, there's an alternative worldview of water that is centered around the small water cycle, and it proposes that rain comes from both the ocean and, and that evapotranspiration from the land, the trees are helping to create the rain, and that it, the evapotranspiration helps to cool the surface of the earth. And according to this view, changes of land use are a major contributor to climate change. So it's not, they're not saying it's only change of la land use. Obviously, the carbon emissions is part of it, but it's not the full story. And so we need to ask ourselves, what if climate change is not just the carbon problem? According to Alpha Lowe, if soil and trees create rain, this explains how humans are creating droughts, deserts, and water scarcity by paving over the land, chopping down trees, and plowing up uh, vegetation. 
So humans are essentially destroying the feedback loop. But the good news is that the process can be reversed. There are plenty of examples where rainfall has increased when the vegetation has been restored. In the tropics, I know in Australia they've done it. Um, and for example, there's some exciting work happening in Kenya and Tanzania where they are using buns to rehabilitate land. So this is not, uh, there's no data yet to say that the rainfall has increased. But if you look at that image in the, uh, where, you know, between 2018 and 2022, those are, those are fairly dramatic results. They call them earth smiles, these buns, because they're sort of, yeah, smile shaped. So if changes in land use are causing climate change, it's really time for a rethink. So apart from halting deforestation and, and regreening the deserts, I think agriculture needs a complete overhaul. I took this photograph at, um, about two weeks ago when I went, was on a farm in Khrabo, and frankly, I was shocked. <laughs> um, and I asked myself, how much rain is percolating into this compacted, moss-encrusted soil? Well, I can tell you not much. It was actually raining at the time. It was pooling. There were these deep ruts where the tractors had gone. It was so compacted, and the water was sitting there, and what wasn't sitting in puddles was just running off and eroding the roads really badly. And why is the soil barren? Where is the soil cover that is going to evapotranspire in summer and create rain? Where is the organic matter that feeds the soil microbial life that sequesters carbon? Well, it's a desert, frankly. But on that same farm, the manager is experimenting with cover crops in a new orchard. He showed me how planting medics on the bunkies, the bunkies are the, the raised bits, is creating this natural mat of organics and that it's self-seeding annually. This is important. It's not, he doesn't have to do it, sow it every year. It's actually self-seeding. He also um, planted rye grass in the aisles and pointed out that that's only something you have to do once. He said that rye grass will be there for the next 30 years and then they mow it and lay it down to add further organics. Um, he did point out that the orchard required a lot more labor and weeding initially, but it is already using less herbicide and he, he hopes that it will use less fertilizer in the future. So from a small water cycle point of view, this kind of cover and soil percolation is top notch. I mean, can you imagine? And how about we apply this regenerative approach in our urban landscapes? Can we create these sort of organically rich, planted, spongy spaces in, in cities or urban areas? We already know that the lack of infiltration of water is the single largest contributor to the urban heat island effect. So we, as urban designers, engineers, developers, architects, landscape architects, um, have a big responsibility. We, we have a key role to play in mitigating climate change. Really, the future is in our hands. Now, as Tamsin spoke about earlier, this is nothing new. We already know what to do. I completely agree with her that it's, we've been talking about this for lot, so long. We have fantastic uh, water-sensitive urban design principles, SUDS guidelines and policies. So, so we know what to do, but there is room for improvement. And I think we could take the design directive of slow it, spread it, and sink it and a lot further. We need to radically increase the amount of permeable paving, I think, in urban environments. I mean, parking areas, why can't they be 90% permeable paving? And apart from the infiltration, it would benefit the growth of trees and any other planting that's there. I was frankly, I put that picture in of the, of the upgrade of the Baden Powell Drive because I find it a shocker. It's just concrete channels, paving. It is the most hard kind of unwater sensitive design, water insensitive design that I've seen. So we have these sort of disconnects where on the one hand, the people like Amy and Tamsin are doing incredible work. And then on the other hand, you know, we're building in major infrastructure, which is seems seemingly so insensitive. Um, but I would postulate, I think that resilient landscape design might, will require, require a change of focus and priority, possibly away from aesthetics towards ecosystem services. So for example, here, the, the grass block paving is actually supporting a lot of biodiversity. There's a pioneer fechi in there. There's all sorts of weeds and grasses, but it'll take some getting used to. I'm not sure that this is what people will accept. But from, a, from the tree growing point of view, these trees are going to do really well, and which will also incidentally improve their resilience to the shot hole borer beetle, which we know is, is going to be affecting our trees. Um, I would say in the last century, our main priorities in landscape design has been primarily amenity and aesthetics. By the way, this is not based on data. This is just my own little graphic that I made up. <laughs> And, but what if we shift these priorities and really make a big focus on resilience? 
the ecosystem services, the biodiversity and the amenity, the social side of things, possibly at the expense of aesthetics. I also think we need to reconsider the current obsession with biodiversity and conservation. It is simply not practical to plant shrub species from uh, fire-driven systems such as Fambos and Rhinosterfeld in urban areas that will never burn. We need to select species that will persist for decades with very little human input. And I would say this road verge has passed the test of time and illustrates that very well. What the image doesn't show, this is sort of at its best when the Wansonias are flowering, is that most for the rest of the year, there's a whole variety of exotic weeds that are growing there and grasses and self-seeded plants, ochna, trees. But from a resilience or ecosystem point of view, this is just fine. It is a bit messy to my taste, but hey, it's resilient. <laughs> but so much for the theory. Let's look at a practical example that we recently worked on. This is a low-cost housing development in Mossel Bay. Um, to give you an idea, um, the site is long and narrow. It's, it's three quarters of a kilometer long, and it's between two major arterial roads, the Louis Ferry Road, which goes into Mossel Bay, and, and Bill Jeffrey. Um, the urban design and architecture was done by JSA Architects, and I worked with my colleagues Bruce Bay and Noel McCulley on the, on the landscaping. As often is the case, we were only approached when the project was well underway to fulfill the EMP requirements, basically to green, to plant trees and green, green the, the area. Um, we submitted a budget that included raised tree planters, which were two and a half meters in diameter, because we could see that trees would need protection and we wanted to create um, sort of seating areas and, and use the public spaces as, you know, as, as, as social spaces. But when we were finally appointed a year and a half later, we arrived on site to see a sample housing block with these one meter concrete sort of pot plants in a sea of paving. An underground, a spider web of services, water, electricity, sewage, you can imagine. And then these planters were on top of half a meter of compacted sub base, so there was zero percolation. Um, so, yeah, huge challenge. These flipping concrete rings were the bane of our life. We had to design around them that had already been ordered, they'd been made a special mold. You know, we weren't even appointed when we put this design idea into a budget and now suddenly it becomes the design determinant or something that you've kind of forced to work with. We actually ended up using them in much uh, bigger planters. We used the six quarter segments to create bigger, I don't actually have examples of that. But if you look at the site plan, the top is the whole site, um, and you'll see if the, the red circles are the areas that I'm going to show you, and the bottom is just the, the right-hand side of the, of the plan. So on the right-hand side were, were the so-called FLISP units. These are houses that they're going to sell um, with financial aid. And then on the left-hand side is the breaking new ground houses. And the, the, um, these houses are given away to people that have a combined household income of less than 3,000 rand. So the other thing as designers is there was no community that we could consult or talk to. They weren't even on a housing list when we were asked to design these public spaces. So, you know, we, we didn't do any of what Amy said. <laughs> but we couldn't. We kept on asking who's going to come here. And the municipality, the Mossel municipality, couldn't really give us any answers. So it was really, we had to take a guess, though. And... Um, it is extremely challenging when you take a thousand people from very diverse backgrounds who are basically all those problems come into that new space. Um, but anyway, so I thought I'd just share a few things. The, the, back on the plan, you'll see there were two detention ponds that the engineers had put in, but the, I then saw they were digging the, the stormwater, the channel between the two ponds, linking the two ponds, and it was going to be this solid concrete channel with these really steep sides which would have stopped any sort of circulation across the site. Anyway, I was horrified and begged them to change it to, to permeable blocks and we pulled back the banks so it's really gentle slopes and you can now easily go into it. And it's actually one of the sweet spots on the site. It's got a beautiful view across the bay and the mountains. Now I know why it's called Mountain View because it's one of those cases where you kind of wonder what they're talking about. Um, and it supports a lot of biodiversity, the channel. The other thing that's really worked quite well is the, the open curb. So tree planters with open curbs where the paving drains into it. But um, there was normally you would have a, a, a drainage system at the bottom to take away any excess water. But there was nothing to tap into and there wasn't any budget. So we took a chance. I was a bit nervous about that because all this paving, the water from the paving was going into these planters. 
And so there's great potential for water logging. But the deciduous trees have done well, the river Combretum, Erythrophyllum, and Circe Pendulina, and the underplanting as well. We, we designed for very dry with Aristida and succulents and phages and things, and then for very wet. So there's arum lilies and fire perkers that are doing quite well at the moment because it's been the wettest winter ever. We also obviously planted local species. There weren't that many on the site, but milkwoods and Pittosporum veridiflorum, the cheesewood was there, and they've done exceptionally well. No surprise there. This was also a, a passively watered tree planter, which the Tocananthus didn't like, so also doesn't really surprise me. We used self-seeding species like Klipdacher, um, the Leonotus. I saw it was growing, doing very well in one part of the site. There's always low budget areas that have no landscape, and we just popped in seedlings and it's just the credit itself. Not without its problems, things like Beto are gonna eventually become an issue. Um, these open blocks were, as I said, we had nothing to do with the real layout and hard landscaping or the drainage of the, of the site, but there was a sort of leftover area which had no, no paving budget. So I said, well, can we put in some grass blocks? And the engineers loved it because they didn't have to put all the layer works underneath, so it was a budget saving. And again, from a biodiversity point of view and from a soil building point of view, it's a real win and it's, it's parking. Um, the other thing we had to decide was how are we gonna water the stuff and we, I decided to hedge my bets. So we did use some drip irrigation on this very long berm, which was also an EMP requirement, but mostly all the watering was done by hand. And thanks to a fantastic watering contractor called Max Modise, who you see in this picture, it's worked really, really well. Um, they watered over 500 trees and lots of additional planting, but I wrote a good spec. I said they have to maintain these watering basins, very important. They must water deeply and infrequently. And the trees have had a really good start and done exceptionally well. The drip irrigation, on the other hand, as I was worried about, has been vandalized. I thought if it was out of sight, maybe out of mind, but of course people started finding it and they thought it was, I think, con uh, conduit. So they cut it open to see if there's any copper in it and then by that stage your drip's not working. So it's been repaired a lot. Um, we did plan activities to try and involve the community. Look, it's never enough, but we, the, I did also put in a budget for um, wall art. For, I wanted that to be like a, an interactive community building thing. In the end, they did use professional um, mural artists, but it was a big process before that, before they came up with the designs which involved the community. Um, and we had planting with the kids, planting beans and tomatoes. Interestingly enough, that was done in December. We, I came back a few months later and these beans had grown fabulously well and the tomatoes were green that size. No one eating the beans, not a single person. They were hanging in bunches. So then we showed the kids. I said, look, and I mean, because it's all languages there, so a lot of it's just mime, but I started eating this bean and these kids descended on these beans and ate them like crazy. I think they'll be farting a lot later. <laughs> but. I mean, it seemed to me, I had never considered that you'd have to show someone that you have, can eat a bean. I mean, personally, they taste better when they're slightly cooked al dente, but, um, but hey. This project has many, many problems, and I'm gonna skip it because I think my talk is getting too long, but basically, the community building side of it is hugely challenging, and a landscape is not gonna solve that. The levels of vandalism is off the chart, the littering, um, but the drugs, the gangsterism, I think in the first three months, three people were murdered in this place. So, and I, I had to, with all my idealism, I had to realize that you can't fix this with a pretty landscape or a beautiful social space. These need to be activated with activities that come from the community. They need to take ownership. And when you've just moved in, what is there to take ownership of? Um, and I get the sense that there's a lot of fear. I, I walk around and think, where is everyone? If these people are unemployed, which mostly they are, where are they? They're sitting inside, I think, because it's not safe. So our objective was very much to draw people into the public spaces, because I believe that if there are lots of people, they'll become safer. And some things did work. The outdoor gym equipment has been a real success. And as I predicted, it's become a sort of a hangout space for teenagers take cell phone, no one's really doing the exercise, and I really, I don't care. It's a place where people are, and it means that that space then is occupied and becomes safe. We also used rocks as bollards because we realized that everything would be parked on if we didn't keep cars out. And I don't think people are gonna be moving those in a hurry, good luck to them. 
and um, they also serve as sort of informal seating. We used low walls in, some, in one of the parks also as informal seating. There's a slide that goes down the berm that's been used a lot. There are also a couple of these little community parks. There are about five of these which are completely surrounded by housing, and which I think is ideal. I mean, it's a social space, it's overlooked, should be really safe. But within two months of people moving in, residents would come to us begging us to take away the benches because the tickets were there and causing trouble. And there's smashed bottles. I mean, the litter is nothing. I overlook that now. But the, the broken glass is such an issue. We were going to mulch these spaces. But in the end, we decided not to because, you know, glass and mulch, if that mixes, you've got no chance of seeing it or removing it. Um, so what has worked, I would say, is that we made easy access into the park. So each one had access from all four sides. You want to make it easy for people to go in. We used grass block paving just to harden that where you enter and bollards to keep cars out. And then we used fences to protect the planting and also as climbers spaces for, so there's granadillas and jasmines and all sorts of stuff growing on there. We also put in the beans and the tomatoes there. Um, planted lots of edibles and medicinals, not really being used, although I think over time it might be. But there's umplonyane, there's blosali, there's impepo, the, the whole lot, it's there. <laughs> They've got a living pharmacy. Um, the play equipment is well used, but we used, they had these sort of swinging wooden slatted bridges. Those broke within two weeks because, of course, adults would be sitting on it and it's not designed for that. So anything with moving parts will break, but the rest just seems to be doing well. Uh, the parks are full of litter. There is tramping, but, but I'm still actually pleasantly surprised at how well the plants have done, all with hand watering and despite this heavy traffic. And one park was clean, and that this woman strode up to me and she said, Echoes are quite dunny. And she gets the kids to tidy up there, and the, she says the adults sweep the streets, uh, street, sweep the streets. <laughs> and there she is, she's the one with the, with the black jacket. She was very proud of herself. And that's the point, is that we need more quiet tunnies. In other words, over time, people might, she'd taken ownership of this park. And I think over time, this might happen in the other parks or not, we'll see. Um, so if you're interested, I have done quite a few posts on Instagram about this project because it intrigues me. How do we create public spaces? And then finally, last three minutes, a quick call to action. Um, for the engineers and designers out there, you'll, we really know what to do. I just had a question and thought, how do we show these subtle falls and micro-shaping on plans? Like when you're working in CAD, are there symbols for this? If you're designing a swale or these, you know, I find when I'm on site, I'm using my hands and gesticulating and whatever you, how does one do that on a CAD plan? Is this maybe one of the, the sort of barriers or one of the reasons why micro-shaping and this is, is not happening? Um, it's, just, it's just a thought. Um, then Janine Banis, I've already talked about, she uses these ecological design metrics, and I really think this should be our new eco dashboard for projects. Uh, the whole project team should look at these things and think, we should be asking ourselves, how much biodiversity does this site support? How much carbon does it sequester? How much soil are we building here? How many liters per square meter of water are we sinking into the ground? These are things that we can calculate. I personally haven't done it yet, so if someone would like to do it, um, let's work together on a project and try and figure it out, how one would work it out. But I don't think it's rocket science, and, um, but it's, it, does, it is a new way of thinking. For landscapers and growers, I really think we need to focus on designing unirrigated landscapes. We're gonna have to look at rehabilitation techniques, use much more seed, Seed is genetically much better adapted. Um, create biodiverse urban plant communities. Drop this whole obsession with indigenous. Yes, use it, but you know, maybe along with other things. We'll have to write new landscape specifications. Um, consider we need to diversify our lawns. Look at how the clover with its nitrogen fixing has completely you know, greened the lawn locally. And this was at the Greenpoint Park and they were actually gonna herbicide it. <laughs> because they want the grass to look good. But, you know, if we change our conception of what a law needs to look like and we embrace the clover, then there we go. We can build soil fertility with legumes and cover crops. Um, this is a project where it um, might be easier with residential, but where once we planted sort of some of the main plants and, and trees, I planted a whole lot of earthalobium decumbens. 
um, just to start working the soil um, and build the nitrogen. <coughs> Local legumes, we've got more than 750 species just in the Western Cape, really no excuse there. There's uh, lovely stuff, Indigophora, Podolyria, Cerealia, that middle one is bottom, bottom center is Indigophora filifolia, waiting to be collected and propagated. Bottom right is um, hypercalyptus. I've got seed. If there are any growers here, come and ask. I'll give it to you. Sutherlandia, very easy, quick pioneer. Raphnia, also very attractive. Let's get into it. So there's work to do. I hope you're feeling as inspired as I am. <laughs> Thank you.